now. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's PreneurCast. Uh, back again with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. Hey, hey, how's things, buddy? Great, great. And I hear big news from the Williams camp. <laughs> there is some very exciting news. Yes, there is. Going to lay it on us or keep it in suspense? No, we're uh, having a baby, which is very exciting. Oh. So uh, end of January, we'll uh, have another little, uh, well, the, the first um, addition to the, uh, the newly formed Williams clan, which is very exciting. Fantastic. Congratulations to you, you and much. your lovely wife. Fleur is super excited, which is uh, which is good. And, you know, so far, so good. No real morning sickness or uh, any sort of uh, side effects, so to speak, of, which has uh, been very, very um, uh, well received so far, which is great. Excellent, excellent. So other than the, the big news, what else have you been up to this week? Oh, look, plenty of uh, crazy shenanigans as always, you know, um, just uh, working on the, uh, the the Profit Hacks project, which I don't think we've really mentioned too much about, but uh, that's coming together we pretty haven't. soon. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be that. bringing that up in a in a in a future episode, real soon now, I'm sure. Yeah. What about? Uh, I'll, I'll ask the age-old question: Read any good books lately? Um, well, actually, yeah, I've been I've been rereading a, a fantastic book uh, called The Forty Eight Laws of Power by Robert Greene, which is a, a really cool book, and I think it's a a bit of a must read for for anybody again it's sort of that influence um Chaldini's influence book type um must read no matter what you're sort of uh, doing with your life whether you're a, a marketer or not and i think the 48 laws of power fall into that as well and i've i've been rereading that um off the back of um trust me i'm lying by Ryan Holiday who's who works um for Robert Greene so I kind of thought i'd just you know delve down that rabbit hole again but part of that I've um, been listening to the 50th law by Robert Greene and 50 Cent, uh, Curtis Jackson, the rapper. They uh, collaborated on a book called The 50th Law, which is sort of part Curtis, 50 Cent, Jackson's um, autobiography, part um, strategy, part um, strategy around dealing with fear and, and, and power. And it's... um. It's quite good, so I'll be listening to the audio version of that, which is uh, very, very cool. Wow. Um, so that's two, two book recommendations in two minutes. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> so I'm guessing that uh, that you listened to the audio version on from Audible, that's right? That's it, mate. Audible is the place to go. That's where I uh, get the majority of my audio books. So there's a whole okay. bunch of good stuff in there. So a little, a little shout out to, to Audible, who are one of our sponsors. Um, very quickly, if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast, the link will be in the show notes, you can get a free trial on Audible. You can download a free book in audio format. And Pete, both Pete and I really, really consume a lot of our content in audio format. And Audible is a fantastic library and resource for getting that audio content for any kind of book, not just business and um, personal development books. Absolutely, exactly. So yeah, it was at audibletrial.com forward slash Preneurcast. Is that the, that's the address, isn't it, mate? That's the one. But Beautiful. as always, all links are in the show notes. Perfect. So let's uh, let's get on and get into this week's topic. Now, this week, I've got a little bit of a, it's a mini rant. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on the rant too much, but it does raise a great topic that I think you might have some input into, uh, being a man of many talents and many businesses. I want to talk about scalability. Uh, yep. Scalability is, is something that's come come up for me recently. Um, I work for myself. I've been, been self-employed for a very long time now. Um, I've previously worked for large companies, and I mean really large companies. Um, and going from a large company to, to working on your own can sometimes be a bit daunting because you suddenly realize what all the jobs are. Need to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, and, uh, in a big corporation, you kind of never come across the accounts department or the the service department or um, that sort of stuff. You sort of are isolated in your own little world and your own floor of, of of the the building. That's right. That's right. I mean, there are there are as every entrepreneur knows, there are a lot of jobs to do in running a business, um, and it's easy to get caught up in doing them. Now, let, let, I don't really want to talk about talk about that as a separate topic, but. 
when when you are your business, when you are the person providing the the, the service or the product or whatever it might be, one of the biggest problems you're going to face, if you can even overcome getting somebody else to do all those other minutia so that you can get on doing that thing, one of the biggest problems you've got to overcome is scalability. The ability to produce whatever it is that you're selling or doing or whatever uh, beyond your own personal capacity. At some point, you are always going to hit a ceiling. You're always going to hit a limit of what you can do. Um, and it, it was a, it was a silly little thing that flagged this with me. There's, I, there's my own experiences uh, of, of scaling my business, but it's a silly little thing, and it was to do with the signs that somebody doesn't think beyond themselves or their current organization size or scale. And let me just let me know, Pete, before we go on to scalability, just let me know if you've ever come across this before. Somebody sends you a file attached to an email. Yep, I've, I've received that before, yep. You may have received a, a <laughs> file. I have seen that, yes. Very good, Pete. Thanks for that. Uh, I am the fall guy yet again. Ah, ha, ha. Um, and that file is, for example, called map. Yep. Or... No, no. Let's let's not go silly as document one. That's just that's just silly. But it's it's called map or competition it's entry. Something that's extremely generic. Something that is so phenomenally generic that even the person sending it would not be able to find that file again if you put a large amount of money on the table in front of them. Yeah. Let alone if their business depended on it or. As, as, as I'm now going to segue to our topic, if there was more than one person working on that business. Because one of the things that you have to do a lot in business when you when there's more than one of you is move information around and share it, whether it's you know, share it with the person sat next to you or share it with your, your team, your outsourcers distributed around the world. And so I just it just really raised it to me. I, I've seen it a lot for one reason or another. I've seen a lot of people attaching a lot of files to a lot of emails or I've received a lot of files through for one reason or, or seen a lot of files for one reason or another just recently. And and this is a huge thing and it's like it's one of those little little signs that I think that people people don't quite think beyond beyond their own desktop. Yep. And it's a warning sign for scalability. So I, I know my, my accountant uh, experiences that same sort of issue because you know at the end of the financial year, all his small businesses and, and, and corporations and, and things like that that he deals with are sending him copies of their uh, you know, MyOB files or their accounting files and every file is exactly the same. It's just the financial year uh, dot, you know, MYOB or whatever the file format is. So he's getting all these emails from everyone with exactly the same file name because it's just a generic... Um, data file out of the software. Yeah. So I mean, to, to to roll this up and to actually, you know, don't don't talk about a problem without a solution. That's my rule. Um, you know, when I was at high, when I was in high school, okay, and and we were being taught to write resumes or, or CVs, as, as we English people call them. Um, we were told back then, you know, it was the early days of of, of computing, and um, we were all sending our files in whatever format they may have been. But we were told, you know, don't call it resume. Mm. Call the file, put your name in the name of the file. So when it gets to the other end, instead of just like if you had a pile of paper, if you can imagine you had a pile of paper in front of you and every one of those sheets of paper, all it said on it was resume. It didn't have anything to identify the person in any way, shape or form. Um, it, 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 and and it's one of those it's one of those little things again. So I just I just it, it raised the whole issue of scalability. That is such one such a tiny 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 detail of of the whole topic. But, but communication, I think, is a cornerstone. Practicing and getting good at organizing and communicating is is a cornerstone. Certainly, it has been for me to be able to scale my business because we we often say this about outsourcing that. Very often we come across people who say, oh, I can't find a good outsourcer. I can't find a, a good person to take on this task for me. Everybody I've given this task to has failed. And we very often say to those people, look at your communication to them first and make sure that how you communicated to them was good enough to get the job done. Yeah. And it wasn't you talking to yourself because a lot of people do that, don't they? 
Yeah, oh, exactly. Absolutely. I think, you know, for a lot of people who are starting out with outsourcing, it is the primary problem initially is is them. They're, they're, they're not used to communicating properly. They're not used to understanding the context in which the outsourcer comes to a project, whether it's experience or lack of um, or not understanding, you know, like there's just a, a big lack of of context and communication and that is, you know, that that's that issue in its own little bucket. Yeah, so, I mean, really, I, I can talk about what my issues with scalability have been, but what, what issues do people face in your, you know, your experience? You've got a lot of experience in coaching people and, and you know, through mastermind groups and things like that. What are the main issues brought about when you go from being just you or maybe you and a couple of people to a bigger organization? What kind of things do, can people look out for and how can they deal with those issues? Yeah, well, again, like like a lot of topics we cover on the show, it's a, a very, very big rabbit hole. But look, I, I think a big thing is that, you know, so many people just, when they have a small business, if it's a one-man band or even sort of, you know, three or four staff, that the business is fundamentally run off adrenaline. And, and what I mean by that is that there's no, you know, strong core system or process around the business and everything is just done based on people's adrenaline to, to you know, service a customer and, and get a good result and because they're passionate about the business. And, you know, I remember when we first started the telco, we were a very small team, about, you know, four or five people. And at that point, we were, you know, very lucky because you can be nimble, you can be flexible uh, and sort of just get stuff done because you're all in the same room and you all talk to each other and communication is very, very easy. But then what you need to sort of start thinking about, and I guess everyone, you know, listening right now should should take a moment and sort of think about the scale is what would happen if you had twice as many leads coming into the business tomorrow? Um, because you know, you've, got, you've got the funnel, you've got the seven levers funnel that we spoke about and obviously the more leads you have coming into the, into the funnel, into the business, the more customers you're going to have and the more products you're going to have to deliver and the more you know, customer service in the back end you have to, have to deliver. And fundamentally, scale and um, growth generally hits a bottleneck at some point in the business when you actually start throwing more um, into it, into that funnel. So realistically, what would happen to your business today if you doubled the, the leads and the inquiries you actually had? Could your business, A, cope with that increase right now? Um, and I guess the answer should be no. Like The actual answer should be your business should not be able to cope right now with a double of leads because that means you're going to be over-resourced. Like if you can handle twice as much you know, leads and twice as much business right now, that's going to be an issue because you can't, you're going to have excess staff, excess capacity right now, which is not a great way to be profitable in your business. But if you do double those leads, how easy is it for your business to grow? You know, how easy is it for you to actually put a couple more people into the team and have them just step right in and be able to take, take up those projects and just, and just grow? Do you have systems? Do you have documentation? And for a lot of businesses, that'll actually make the business implode by actually you know, doubling that business. You, know, you think, oh, look, for my business to grow and to be profitable, I need to you know, double it all and stuff like that, which is great. And that's you know, where you want to head, obviously, increasing. But you've got to make sure that you don't actually self-implode because one of the... the unforeseen issues that so many businesses face and and you know a, a big driver of business collapse particularly in that sort of small to medium sized business is growth growth actually causes the decline in the business which when you think about it from the outside and just looking at a company you go how's that possible how can you know more sales and more revenue actually cause a business to actually go backwards that's that's the whole point of growth is to get more revenue but if the business can't handle it in that scenario, then you're actually going to be letting down more customers. You're going to actually be actually, you know, having to fund that growth out of somewhere because, you know, how do you buy more hardware and more infrastructure to scale without doing it organically? Because, you know, if you, you can only fund a 10% growth, but you suddenly get a double in, in growth, how do you actually fund the infrastructure needed to generate um, that sort of growth? So that's sort of some of the scalability issues from a higher sort of context. Is that the kind of stuff you're thinking in terms of um, issues That's, with scalability? Absolutely. I mean, that is exactly exactly um, how wh- exactly where I was thinking and that, that's, that's really the kind of cornerstone of my personal problems w- was growth it, it's, it's one of those the world's more ironic problems mm. that, that you end up with too many customers 
in in in, in modern climates the i the concept the mere concept of too many customers you know most people would be glad of that problem um but when it happens as you say it can be it can be crippling um for all kinds of reasons but how would how would you deal with that how did you deal with that how do you deal with that situation that uh, the the going from from you or you and a couple of people to, to being able to quickly bring on new staff or or quickly scale your processes oh look there's there's quite a few sort of things to be aware of and we can definitely run through them i guess the the first point is something that you you talked to earlier don where you need to make sure that what you're doing right now can scale because you know the perfect example is you know if you're naming files map.doc or whatever it might be, like that doesn't scale. You don't, um, and if you, you say to yourself, oh, look, I'll, I'll start naming files correctly and sorting out my customer directory and I'll, I'll start using a, a CRM package when, it's, when I need to, that's too late. And I know that's really one of those really annoying sort of, you know, Advices, pieces of advice that you get where you go, yeah, thanks, Prick, you've given me a, a piece of advice that gives me more work and frustration now. Like, you know, most people don't want to hear that sort of stuff because it's, it is it is frustrating. But, you know, that is the, the way you need to do it. And, and you need to sort of make sure that the systems you're using right now will scale without having to change the system too much. You can adapt the system, but don't have to change it because, you know, if you start off right now with a, a CRM package, you can obviously just expand the, the capacity of your account with high rise or sugar or something like that. So you want to make sure that what you're doing is actually scalable in its own right. So making sure when you name files, you name them correctly, not only for your internal purposes, but also if you start sharing them with clients or with with, with um, you know staff or things like that, that you know you don't have to go back and sort of rename older files for the business to still operate and things like that. You don't have to go back and do things twice. So you need to sort of have that mindset that growth and scalability will come and then make sure what you're doing now allows for that not that oh hang on i'll change it later because that change is inevitably too late and too hard to do because you know if your business is growing rapidly and you have to go back and change all your old processes and your old naming conventions and your, your old file structures and we're getting kind of granular here but this is sort of hopefully a, a real resonating thing for the listeners is that if you have to go back and change that that's three days of work you just don't have when your business is growing those three days are better off spent servicing the customers, not you know, restructuring the business. So you've got to make sure you're putting things in place now that you know, is scalable from that regard. Um, I think another thing that, that's worth sort of thinking about is you know, how do you actually grow? How do you want to grow? Because there's the ability to sort of you know, do the, the VC angel sort of stuff, which obviously is you know, getting a lot of hype and conversation these days where you know, what you do, the way you, you, you grow and you scale is by actually getting outside investors to throw money at you to actually fund that growth. And that's definitely a, a possibility as well as actually going about getting outside funds, giving away some equity, and, and, and that's how you fund that infrastructure growth I kind of spoke at before. But if you want to be a bit more managed with that, then obviously there is times where you say, sorry, I can't take on more business right now. And again, it, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a startup, I know how hard that is to turn away income. Um, and you know, it's one of those things, and I'll get off topic a little bit here and I might rant a bit, but this is something that I, I don't know how to answer. And it's a, a thing I've been having in my mind a lot is that you, know, so you, can, you can listen and you can take as much advice as you know, um, someone could give you and that you know they do say that you know that the best road to success is on someone else's shoulders and you know leaning leaning on someone else's experience and just you know doing what they say but I really do believe there's certain things in in business and particularly in life that you're not going to understand you're not going to internalize until you actually experience the pain and as much as someone can sit here and say you know to grow your business sometimes it's better off to say it to a client sorry I'm not going to take your business even though I would love it because my business can't can't handle it even though that money would pay for a holiday with the family that you'd really, really love to go on, it's extremely hard to say, no, I'm not going to take that income and have that holiday I need or, or you know, buy the new car or whatever it might be that you need for your family for a small business owner. Um, but inevitably, you, go through, you, you take that client on, you go through the pain of not being able to service that person, you go through the pain of actually you know, not only losing that client but under servicing another, a, a current client and you actually end up losing two clients and have a lot of pain and that's when you get the lesson. And I don't know a good way 
to actually do that. Maybe I should have spoken to that about Peter and maybe we can get Peter Shallard back on a show again and talk about that sort of uh, experience. But uh, I, as much as I can sit here and say there's, there's times you need to do that, I know people are going to listen and go, nah, that's crap. You know, How can I say no at that time? And it's really hard to do that. And I don't know the so- psychological lesson around that. But um, I do think that sometimes you have to experience stuff before. As much as someone can tell you and give you advice, you just need to experience some things before you really internalize it. And, and those things are probably different for everybody else. Like some people listening will go, yeah, yeah, I get that. And I'll, I'll say no to certain clients so I don't scale too quickly. Whereas others would have listened to other episodes and go, nah, I'm, I'm better than that advice. And we'll go out and actually um, have a crack at, uh, at you know, the, the opposite of what we're advising. And then obviously, you know, feel the pain and get the experience that way. And that's why, that's why they get that particular lesson. So it's a bit of a left-hand tangent turn, which you often do here on the show, but Hopefully that sort of resonates with a few people, and I'm not quite sure if that resonates with your experience at all, Dom. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I while while I'm somewhere down the middle of what you the two ty- two types of people you described there, um, I I like to think that I'm able to learn from other people's mistakes without recreating them. Um, but sometimes some lessons are, are hard to take in, and that that one that particular one was hard for me. Mm. Um, because when, especially especially when you're new to business on your own, when you're just starting out, and it's your first time around, then that is a very very difficult thing to take on. That this idea that you can turn turn down business. Well, particularly if if you're treating revenue and profit as a scorecard. Yes, and so many people do. Yeah, and that's and that's, that's a very fair thing. But again, like. You have to, and again, it's a really hard one to say, is that you have to sort of, you know, and I think I wrote to this or wrote about this in my first book, was that what's the purpose of starting the business? What is the real core reason you started your business? For most people, when you actually really sit down and drill it down, it's, it's lifestyle is why they started the business. They don't want to have to work for the man. Um, and, you know, riches and profits and things like that are actually a, a secondary thing because it's the riches and the profits they think will actually help them fund the lifestyle but there are so many businesses out there that are scaled up rapidly that are making just just spitting out cash but the owner hasn't got any time to spend it because he's too busy on the hamster wheel trying to keep, keep the system going that he that he scaled so quickly which is not scaled the, the, the right way um and realistically, yeah, you can say he's winning that winning that that rat race because he's you know he's working for himself and he's generating all this money. But you know that was not the goal that that she had when she started that business. The goal she had when she started the business was actually to have lifestyle. So you know scaling and growing uh, in a controlled way, if you think about it, sometimes actually gives you the outcome you want without necessarily the profits that you thought was the, was the correct scorecard. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, really, you're talking there about scaling smart, mm. yeah. And I, I love the fact. And you, you know, you're right. It's, it's a very important part of, of of the stuff that you wrote in your earlier book. That you have to realize why you did it. And you, you basically have to remind yourself why you did it, so that you can scale smart. I've come across a number of businesses that have a very strange mathematical difficulty, and that is that. They've grown, i.e. they've taken on more people, but their net profit is less than when Mm -hmm. there were one or two people in the business. Because once you start growing your staff, you start growing your overheads and your responsibilities, and as you say, you end up potentially on this hamster wheel running to keep the business going now because you're employing other people and you're paying their wages and 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 the overheads associated maybe bigger office space and etc cetera, etc cetera. and and you do have to stand back you do have to look at what your your goal was when you started to and and evaluate and say to yourself is this thing that I'm going to do, this scale, whether it's take on this big new big contract or look at a new product line or, or whatever it is, is that going to take me away from this goal? Because, as you say, and it's a very it's a, it's a mindset thing, and I'm 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 very big on mindset just just lately, um, and and because it's important, mind, mindset is a really important thing, and you know the the Peter Shellob interview really you know was spoke very very strongly to me 
you know, and I, I, I do think that if we can get Peter back on and ask him some of these questions, I think it will make some really interesting content. Um, because that that mindset of of chasing the profit, when the reality is, as you say, most people are actually after the lifestyle, and one does not beget the other necessarily. Um, mm. You know, I mean, just really off on a tangent briefly, one of the best examples of that I I saw was was the the kind of the simple simple napkin math that Tim Ferriss did in the four hour work week. Yeah. Where he he just says, you know, you think that this lifestyle costs this much, so you think you need to earn that much. But if you look at what you can get this lifestyle for and, and how you do it, then you realize that you don't have to do those things you thought you had to do. You don't have to turn that profit. You don't have to have that many clients or, or have that scale of business or whatever. So it's a really big thing. And it's, so... I think really those two points that you made in your little segment there, the one of prepare for the prepare for scalability before you need it mm-hmm. and do it consciously with with a goal in mind, I think it's probably just just everything you could possibly say. I mean that's that's the two best pieces of advice is exactly where where I you know, going into this and thinking, you know, what 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 do I want to say? If somebody asked me, what would I say? Those are the two things that I would say. Mm. You know, and I think because a lot of people do, they are afraid of that first point. Sorry, you were going to say. I was just going to sort of get a bit more granular and more practical for people as well. So rather than just sort of Great. give you know context and, and, and strategy, we, you know, it, people sort of then say, okay, well, well, how do I go about getting ready to scale? What what do I actually? What do the actions look like? You know, let, let's sort of you know GTD this and what do the actual actions look like when you're getting ready to scale? Because you know, I don't want to just talk theory and not give anything practical in in the show. So, you know, you sort of spoke to it, you know, before as well. One option is actually to obviously, as you're saving files and 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 putting folders and uh, together on your computer. And this is very very granular. And I know a lot of the listeners and, and part of a lot of the people in the preneur community have online businesses. I know it's a big portion of the listener base, and obviously they are very much. You know, their business is inside their laptop. That is their company. That is their their their, their whole business. That's their infrastructure. So that's very important. You know, you wouldn't you know start a retail store without a, a great you know front end, which is you know the equivalent of a, a nice website. And you wouldn't start a manufacturing company without having a good warehouse or a logistics. And that is your, the structure of your computer. You know, the, so you want to make sure that you know your file structure is right. And, and you know, I'm I'll put my hand up. I know I'm I'm, I'm not the greatest at this. Uh, well, definitely not historically. I'm I'm definitely getting better. In that you know, when you're saving files on your computer. Do it properly. Don't just have your, my documents and save every single file into my document. So you've just got one folder with 500 files in there. Actually use a folder structure. Uh, and I don't know if, I can put, if I'm going to put you on the spot here, Don, but is there any quick tips you can give about folder structures and file name convention just to sort of give that sort of real granular sort of le- lesson there? And then I want to talk about some process map stuff as well. Yeah, great. I mean, I, I, this, is, this is my subject, as you know. You're not, not particularly putting me on the spot. Um, you know, whenever you and I work on a project together, you, I'm the guy who puts together the the, the file name strategy for it. Um, I mean, the best thing you can do, and this is this is actually, um, just to slightly digress to come back, um, a lot of people you focus on the computer, but as long as the process is solid, the actual technology can be implemented further down the line. You know, we're talking about folders and files and names and, and, and labels and things. But folders and files and names and labels have existed for hundreds of years. They just now, we're putting them on a computer. The irony is that if if you had a desk in front of you and you had physical folders and physical pieces of paper, you'd see it get out, get out of hand. You'd see mm. it. You'd see the problem immediately. But because the computer kind of lets you get away with it and hides it away almost invisibly in that My Documents folder, people just carry on and carry on. Yeah, there's no physical uh, manifestation of the issue. Yeah, there, there is. There, that's right. There's no real physical manifestation. So, so, so you know, this doesn't... You, we're not saying quick computerize everything if you're not ready to do it. And, and also, don't, you know, don't go crazy and spend thousands on systems that, that aren't necessarily what you need. It's all about just the systems and processes. And the basics, and this, this system came from, that I use, came from uh, a, a bunch of guys I worked with for a while, and they managed their jobs 
with literally physical envelopes that were printed on the outside that they wrote on in by hand with a biro, and they put the, the, the elements of the, the job at hand in these envelopes, and then they physically moved the envelopes between, uh, like, the, the letter trays that you see, the old-fashioned letter trays, like the in-tray and out-tray kind of thing. And that was their system, and I just replicated their system on a computer. So one of the things they, that was cornerstone to their, their entire system was allocating some kind of identifier to every client. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as three letters. Now, the three letters that I use are the first letter of the first name and then the first two letters of the second name. So no great secret, but every file I ever create that's got anything to do with you has got PWI at the beginning of it. Yep. Okay. Now, if that file gets dropped, lost, attached to an email, filed in the wrong place, you name it, as long as that file exists somewhere, I can find it because it's got PWI, and PWI as a three-letter code is unique to you. If I come across somebody else whose letters make up PWI, then unfortunately I'm going to have to, you know, pick another letter or something. And I have a record of what all those codes are for all the clients. Then I have a second level code, which is a three-letter code for the project. So we talked briefly at the beginning about profit hacks, and I'll just open that loop back up again just to put it in people's minds for when we do talk about it. All profit hacks materials are inside my system anyway, PWI with a dash, and then PRH for profit hacks. It could have been PHA, I guess but it just happens that it was PRH. So, PWI, PRH. And uh, Preneurcast is PWI, PRC. Yep. Uh, and so, literally, every single file and the whole folder structure and everything is organized around that. So, I have a, I have a client folder, and inside that, so a, a PWI, Pete Williams client folder, and inside of that, I have a folder for Preneurcast, a folder for Profit Hacks, a folder for the seven levers of business, uh, a folder for the... Uh, Preneur Platinum, and, and and then I organize below that. And even just that top level of organizing by client and then by project or by sequential job that you do for that client, so you could just have that client code followed by a four-digit number, which is just the next job you do for them and the next job and the next job, It's a, it, it organizes things to a reasonable level of granularity. You don't have to get obsessive about it. You know, that will manage most people's filing systems quite happily. You know, for for anybody that has regular work with with a, a, a reasonable number of clients, and you're away, you know, if you only have your own projects, it's still worth creating those folders and maybe having that three letter code for the project internally. So, Pete, on your computer, you might have you know a projects folder, and in there you might have P R H for profit hacks, and you might have uh, P R C for Preneurcast, yeah, because it's just internal to you. Yeah, I T E for I Telecom. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's just a way of, of just segmenting things out. And, and I guess the, the, the other thing on that, before, you, before we go on to the other point you wanted to make, is, is even if you spend one Sunday afternoon thinking through this and setting these folders up, one of the things that applies to so many of the things that we talk about in Preneurcast and so many things to do with organizing and, and just taking action and doing things is that the easier it is the less friction there is for you to do that thing the more likely you are to do it and in the case of filing if you spend one sunday afternoon you can even sit in front you know sit in front of the olympics or whatever whatever you choose to do but get a get a little word document open or a google doc spreadsheet whatever and just go through your client list make up the code names and create the folders the next time a new piece of material comes in for that client you've automatically got somewhere to put it. You've got a bucket to place it in, a place to capture it, and, and, and an idea in your mind about how to name it. And, and if those names are logical, you don't even have to look at your reference. You just do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's it. And that, that can be the beginning of you organizing everything and, and just moving forward. So that a classic example is the next person in on your team, you have to be able to tell them where to find something. <laughs> it's like, right now, yeah. I'm away from my home office, right? 
right now I'm away from my home office. I'm traveling for work. Um, I'm sat in a completely isolated location. I'm, I have one computer in front of me. There's no way I could possibly carry every piece of work and every client file because they're huge. And, but I, so they're back in the home office. But I know, literally, I don't need to sign on to my home computer. I don't need any technology at all. I can send one email and I can say to, to, to somebody back at the home office, please give me the file for this. And I don't even need to tell them where to look because that process has already been organized. They, everybody knows that's how we file things. Yeah. So I don't actually need to give a precise description of where the file is or even what it's called. Because the system's in place and everybody knows what it is, it's easy for them to go onto that machine, to go into the central, like, central hard drive, go through the directories as I've just described to you, and find the file and get it to me. Mm. And, and that... that productivity increase, that lack of struggle for everybody else, that, that reduction in friction is phenomenal It's for productivity and, and for scalability because literally it took, it took me 15 minutes to train someone and test their understanding in that entire system last time I brought somebody onto my team. Yeah, and I think part of that, which is I think we've touched on before in terms of scalability is process maps and and systems and things like that. And oh, yeah. If we haven't spoken yeah. about it before, if you're a, a new listener to Preneurcast, welcome. Welcome to the show. But uh, check out Screen Steps. Uh, it's a fantastic piece of software that's um, cross platform. It. it works on the Mac and the PC. So, um, really cool news though is uh, one of our head developers recently got a MacBook Air and has gone Mac. So, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm slowly Yay. turning everyone in our office from PC to Mac, which is very cool. But <laughs> Screen Steps is a fantastic application which is very, very frictionless, low, low friction, that allows you to easily create systems and process maps while you're doing a particular task or step, which is very, very cool. So I encourage everyone to sort of um, check that out. And as you're doing projects right now, even if you don't have team members but you have that you know, foresight to think that you know very shortly or in the near future, you're going to have to scale and grow your business. Start doing these process process maps now. So as you actually do a, a task and have a little bit of time, spend an extra 10% of that time to actually do that project map and that process map because when you get to that new staff member joining and you actually have this influx of sales and influx of customers and this you know, need to scale fast. You don't want to have to, you know, put the pause button on and spend and invest all this time in training. So that's really important to actually get that done first while you've got the capacity and time right now. Absolutely. That's a great point. And, you know, we, we've we talked to a couple of people, we've coached a couple of people on doing this, and there's lots of great, um, I'm going to use this word, hacks to... Um, to help you speed that process up of, of creating the process maps or describing the processes to people. Um, one of the best ways I've, I've found is to, to have somebody, if you can, watch you do the process and make their own notes. Um, but if they're not available really? to do that, because if they make their own notes, you can actually then get them to actually write up the process map themselves, which will consolidate it in their minds and means you don't have to do it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that definitely does work, you know, if you sort of are having to scale in retrospect, if you sort of, yeah. you know, are doing this after the fact of hiring someone else, you know, or, or things like that. And, and I know something he's done this exceptionally well is that you know, Dave Jennings, a good buddy of mine, actually what he does is when he needs a new process done in his business, rather than him learning it, he pays someone else to do it and as part of their job requirement is to actually write up the process map. And then he takes, takes that process map and hires someone to do that on a rinse and repeat basis. So he does that very, very intelligently. Yeah, and that's, that is actually from from Dave. I actually took that process exactly, and I've implemented that in my business. Um, you know, some of my staff. That's part of their job description to work out how to do things, to write it up, and to to then allow me to use that process map yeah. somewhere else. So, but but you you did point out there that, that that's that's a retrospective technique, but a, a technique up front. Screen steps is a fantastic way, a fantastic tool. It's it's a a very friction free tool that sits on your computer and enables you to very quickly take screenshots and write a little description with it um, to, to make a document that then you can archive and send on to, to somebody or, or just refer back to it. Absolutely. Um, so that's, that's a great tool. 
um, of course, personally, because I'm, I am who I am and I do what I do, um, I bypass all that and I just turn on my screen recording software, uh, which is screen, ScreenFlow on the Mac or Camtasia on the PC. And I just, if it's anything that can be done on a computer, I just turn that on, record myself doing the actual task yep. and talking through it as if I'm talking to someone. Um, and then I just save that movie file. Yeah, and, and, and it sounds kind of weird for people to to be doing this. It's like, well, hang on, isn't it better off that extra, you know, ten percent of time that I could otherwise invest in doing a process map? Wouldn't I be better off investing that in, you know, trying some little thing to get a new, a new, a new customer or a new client? And realistically, I think when you sort of really think about this, is you know, if it takes you right now twenty minutes to do a particular task, it might take you an extra four minutes to write that process map up because you're already in the flow. You know, really, what are you going to get in the extra four minutes if you invest that somewhere else in your business? By the time you actually, you know, open up AdWords, log in to actually try and tweak an advert, you know, that four minutes is going to be neglect- neglected and negated in just, you know, organizational sort of stuff. You won't actually get any real value out of those four minutes if you invest it somewhere else. But if you invest that at the end of a, of a current task, you'll actually get some good ROI on that time. So hopefully that sort of you know, gets over that little bit of mental friction that a lot of people will have. It's like, well, hang on, why invest that four minutes when I can invest it somewhere else? But I, I think let, let's wrap the show up today and just leave everybody with that question of, you know, really take that time to think about right now what things, what tasks, what steps, what bottlenecks um, are happening in your business right now that would actually fall apart and implode if you doubled the input into that particular process. So if you double the amount of clients, if you double the amount of the actual dispatch of the product, if you, had, if you had to ship twice as many products next week, if you had to receipt twice as many deliveries in your business, uh, you know, if you're an online business, obviously delivering twice as many eBooks or things like that, there's no scalability issues there, which is fantastic. But maybe it might be customer support. If you had twice as many customer support tickets every day, how would you handle that? If you had twice as many just general emails, how would you handle that? So look at as you're going about your day in the next 24 hours and actually sort of as you sit down to do a particular type of task or process in your business, just, you know, in the back of your mind, just have that thought, um, you know, marinating of what would happen if this doubled, if the amount of workload that I'm dealing with right now doubled, how would my business handle that? And I I think that's just a, a good subconscious back of the mind thing that, you know, if you start just having that thought process and asking that smart question, you'll, you'll start seeing and, and, and make some changes from um, smart answers that your brain will give you. That's, that's great. I, I, love, I love that way. It's, it's such a simple analysis. You know, what, what would fall apart if you doubled your client base overnight? Um, it, it's a great way to look at that business and see, see where the weak points are, where, where, you're, where you need to focus. And this sounds really um, silly, but like, think about like, what would actually happen if you had to reconcile twice as many credit card payments in your accounting system every day? And that sounds, that's probably the last thing people think about. But you know, if you are you know, being attentive and, 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 and diligent with your accounts and you are you know, doing your bank rec every day or every week, whatever it might be, you know, what happens, you know, you might, your business might be able to scale from a, a customer service and a product delivery perspective, but what about the bank rec? You know, that actually, I've seen that happen to businesses where they get so busy, they just start neglecting their, their bank recs and that actually causes more issues. And it's little things like you just don't think about. So as you're doing everything in your business, no matter what it is, it's not just about marketing. This is not, scalability is not necessarily a marketing and customer fulfillment issue. So many times, it's the things you don't think about that when they scale, they implode. Things like little things like bank wrecks you just don't think about that take time if you if if they grow. I, I love that actually. I, that's a really good example. It's one of those one of those things, positive things that can turn to a negative. Absolutely, I think it's a great example. And 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 when you find these things, even if you just find one, or if you find a lot of them, but you, you know, there's there's one like that, and it's a process that. That, that you can sit down and maybe just spend half an hour, just just find half an hour. It's like we talk about CFTs, the critical focus time, allocating that time in your day. If you're already doing CFTs, if you're already allocating focus time to business critical tasks, then this is something that potentially you could focus on for one of those little tasks, little little periods of time. And, and you could just make a note about the process. Try and map that process out. You might not get it all done in one session, and maybe you have to come back to it. But that time you spend in mapping that process out now means that when it starts to happen, 
and you're under the pressure that's caused all those other extra pressures that are caused by your business growing by a sudden influx of business or customers or clients or whatever you you've got on file the process so when you need to bring somebody in you can bring them in point them at that process and carry on with your day absolutely um, and and that's really, I guess, speaking back to your, you know, four minutes at the end of any task, looking for a way of documenting it. That's where that that investment of time now pays you off a hundredfold later. Absolutely. Um, and on that, I, I just that was that was so much more than I could have hoped for out of that one <laughs> little one little comment at the beginning. Uh, we're bang on time, so uh, let's let's close up for the night um, and well for the week, sorry, and uh, hopefully. Everybody got something out of that little ran, slightly random and, and wandering chat about scalability. Uh, quick reminder, as always, folks, um, if you haven't already, pop over to sevenlevers.com to uh, take a look at our home study course on the seven levers of business. And um, leave us a comment on preneurmedia.tv, uh, where you also find recordings and transcripts and show notes for every one of our episodes. And I, what I really iTunes. love is sorry, sorry to interrupt you there, mate. But we haven't sort of Please asked do. this of, of people for a while. Is that we'd really love some iTunes reviews? That does definitely help us uh, scale our listener base. So it's a, a very uh, good input that everyone can do for us. If you can, if you do enjoy the show and you, and you like to listen, um, you know, the more reviews we get, the more listeners we get and the more other various things we can use to, to leverage the, the, the show off. So if you if you can take literally 30 seconds, jump onto iTunes and just leave us a review, it'll be a great way of, uh, of saying thanks to us for doing the show every week and we'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. And it really does take a few seconds just to pop onto iTunes, um, wherever you are, and just, just leave us a quick review. Let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we're doing wrong. Um, and, you know, there's even the opportunity to make fun of my accent if you really want to. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you again for another great Preneurcast episode. And uh, we'll be back bigger and better uh, next week um, via Preneurmedia.tv or obviously Preneurcast on iTunes. See you next week, folks. Ciao. You've been enjoying another fine episode of Printercast with Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via Printercast at printergroup.com. <laughs>